In this video, we're going to be looking at something that's known as constructive and destructive wave interference and apply it to what we know about vectors. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to review mechanical waves from both a system and an object perspective. We're going to define what wave interference really is and identify its different types. And we're going to use vector addition, addition to predict what the resulting shape would be when two or more waves overlap. Why are we doing this? Well, for starters, waves is a confusing topic for most people because they have properties that are unlike things that we see with physical objects that we are used to. Understanding waves takes time. So if we start on this now and work on it throughout the entire year, we'll have plenty of time to get a full understanding of waves when you actually need to have that understanding. Wave interference is also a property that takes a key role in many different behaviors of waves. They also are used in many different wave applications that we have in everyday life. Also, since we'll be able to use vectors to predict what the resulting overlapping wave looks like, we're able to enhance what we know about vectors now to this application. So the first thing we have to be clear on is what do we mean when something passes through something? So here we have a bullet that's being shot through a bottle of water, and we have a ghost that's passing through a tombstone. And the question is, is the bullet passing through the bottle of water? And while most people turn around and say, yes, it is, it's not really passing through as it is forcing the bottle to go around the bullet. If you notice, when the bullet after it quote unquote passes through, the bottle is definitely in a different condition than it was before. When we have the ghost that's passing through the tombstone, however, you can't tell if anything's ever happened to the tombstone. And that's because there's been no physical change made to the tombstone. So when things pass through, it's kind of like that ghostly type passing through where there's no change, there is no damage. A lot of times when we turn around and say something has passed through, we mean punched through where it has made a hole and the bullet never really went through the water. The water went around the bullet. In fact, if we take a look at this picture right here, you can actually see the water that has been pushed around the bullet as it travels through. So the bullet isn't passing through anything rather than it's being, um, it's making a hole. Now, if you view the bottle as just an object, it's passing through the object. But actually, as a system, we can see it's not pass, the bullet's not passing through anything. It's actually forcing things to go around. Very similar to a person who's pushing their way through a crowd. They don't actually physically pass through anyone. They just push everyone off to the side. Waves, however, do pass through one another. Here we see water waves that are rippling through. And we can see areas in where the waves get higher where the water level gets bigger and little valleys that are formed within the water level. But at no point do we see any damage being done to the water surface, just like the ghost passing through the tombstone. So why is this? Why do waves get to pass through uh, objects and pass through each other while physical objects don't? And the simple reason for that is waves themselves don't have any physical matter. They look like an actual entity, an actual structure, but the reality is that they are nothing more than a, an illusion, if you will, of the motion of the individual particles that make up the material. A wave is really just a disturbance of particles. A wave isn't actually real itself. When we look at the wave as an object, and we describe its height or amplitude or its length or its wavelength or the number of times we see it per second or its frequency. It is easy to think of it as a solid object, but it really isn't. It's actually a collection of particles that are moving individually, some in one direction, some in another, and all at different speeds. And so that's what we actually see. It's kind of like a person versus a group. If we have a group, we can often describe the group as having an opinion or the group got angry or the group is happy. 
but there is no actual collective, well, there is no actual intelligence to the group. It's not real. It's a whole bunch of individuals. And some could be happy, some could be angry, some could be wanting to do one thing, some could be wanting to do another, but the overall effect that we see is what we describe as the group. That's the wave. But there is nothing really there. It's a whole bunch of individual people. It's a system. And that's what we have here. And so while people cannot pass through other people, groups can pass through groups because people can individually move off to the side for one another and the groups can pass through because they're not physically there. Here we have a case on a person who is making two sets of waves. You can see that they have like these two little balloons and they're bumping them into the water and the way each one makes a set of waves. The waves all overlap. And if you notice, a pattern starts to form in the wave. We have regions in the waves on where the waves get very high. And we have other sections in the waves where they get very low. So the yellow will circle the low regions. These indicate two different kinds of wave interference. Now interference just really means that I am altering somebody else. I'm either helping them or I am trying to stop them from doing something. That's what we really mean by interference. And when two waves overlap, they will always interfere with each other. One type of interference is known as constructive interference. This is when two waves run into each other and the two waves are what we call in phase. To be in phase means that their amplitudes are on the same orientation. They both want to go up, they both want to go down, they both want to go right, they both want to go left. They're both trying to do the same thing. When these two waves meet, they constructively interfere, which means they build upon each other, making a larger wave. This is only temporary though because the waves are physically passing through each other, because again, waves don't have any physical nature to themselves, really. And they're just a disturbance. And so these two waves simply pass through each other. There is no bouncing whatsoever, but at this one point where they meet up, they actually construct a larger wave. That's these regions here where we can see these high bumps. Destructive interference, however, is when two waves meet, they're in opposite phases. That means the amplitudes of the two waves are going in opposite directions. One wave wants to go up, the other wave wants to go down. When these two waves meet, they oppose each other, resulting in a smaller wave or a wave that cancels out. When they overlap completely and cancel out completely, we see these low regions right here that are regions of destructive interference. The way that we can figure out constructive interference is really, really simple. Here I have wave A, here I have wave B. Now I always think of this as hills and holes. If wave A has a height of three and wave B has a height of two, I think of this as a hill of three meeting a hill of two. And if a hill of three meets a hill of two and I was to merge them into one hill, I'd get a hill of five. But the waves then pass through each other. So while this is the merger of A plus B, in the end, B will just move on its merry way and A will move on its merry way and there's absolutely no change. The reality is A and B don't even realize they engage with each other. A is just moving in this direction having its good old wave time, B is moving in the opposite direction, having its good old time. They run into each other, they don't even notice, and then B keeps on moving, A keeps on moving, with no, cha no change in their speed, their frequency, or their wavelength. The only thing that changed was the overlapping amplitude at the point on where they overlap. If A was a whole of three and B was a whole of two, when I have a whole of three meeting a whole of two, I get a whole of five. And then of course, they just pass on through, never realizing 
at all that they had ever met. Destructive interference runs the exact same way, but sometimes the waves cancel out completely and sometimes they don't. If the waves do not cancel out completely, we call it partial destructive interference because there's a little bit left over. Partial constructive could have a bump on the upside or on the downside, it doesn't matter. And again, hills and holes make a lot of sense here. If I have a hill of three that runs into a hole of two, then when the hill of three falls into the hole of two, I'd have a hill of one left over. Then the waves pass on through, so I'd still have a, hill, a hole of two and a hill of three, never realizing that this ever happened. Had this been flipped upside down, where I'd have a hill of two and a hole of three, I'd have a hole of one, because I have more hole than a hill. And again, it would just be partial destructive interference, and the two hills and holes, the two waves would just pass on through, never realizing this happened. But sometimes I'll have a hill of three and a hole of three. And when a hill of three falls into a hole of three, I get flat ground. There's nothing left over. The two waves have totally destroyed each other during this overlap. The problem with this name, though, it's very misleading. Because normally if I totally destroy something, it's gone, it's never coming back. Nothing was really destroyed. It's really just hidden. Now all of a sudden I have my hill of three and my hole of three moving in opposite directions as if nothing happened because nothing was really destroyed. It was just an illusion because they both canceled out at this one point. And when I say they, I mean their motion, not the energy, not the particles, just the messaging. And for that simple reason, we don't see anything and it was called total destructive interference, but it really is a misnomer because nothing was really destroyed. What we're really using here is something known as the superposition principle. And it's something that we've worked with with adding vectors tip to tail. The superposition principle simply says the following. When I want to find the result of two things that are overlapped, such as waves, I simply just overlap the one on top of the other as if I'm adding them up by vectors through the tip tail method. And when we add vectors to the tip tail method, its official name is the superposition method. So here we have two waves that are very weirdly shaped, and we want to find out what the resultant is going to be when they overlap. The easiest way to do all of these types of questions is to view them as a system of vectors. So I just follow a very simple multi-step process that takes very little effort to do. People who don't follow this process often get confused later on when we start looking at very unique shapes. So here I have a triangle shape meeting a square shape. This guy's going to be moving in this direction. This guy's moving in this direction. And the question is, what do they look like once they overlap? So the first thing I'm going to do is view each vector, I'm uh, sorry, each wave as a system of vectors. I want the number of vectors in each shape to be the same because I have to overlap my vectors. So that's all I'm going to simply do is instead of a triangle, I now have five vectors. Two have no height because they're at the bottom of the triangle. Two are medium height, one is a high height. For the rectangle, all the vectors are the exact same height because it's a rectangle, easy enough. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to label my vectors so I know which vectors are going to be overlapped. Because when I actually overlap this, it's not going to be E and A together. That's when these guys just meet. I'm going to have to add vector A to vector A, B to B, all the way to E to E. So I'm going to just have the corresponding vectors now overlap with each other. Now I'm going to do that tip to tail. So here's the base of the wire or the string or whatever the wave is in. And then I just have one vector, then the next one. If you notice, A and A, then B and B, C and C, E and D, E and E. This now gives me an overall shape. So now if I draw out as if connect the dots, I see 
the shape of the wave. So that's going to be pretty much about it. If the waves go in opposite directions, I do the exact same thing. Now, the velocities always go in the opposite directions. So when I said opposite directions, I was referring to their amplitudes. This is the amplitude of this wave. This is the amplitude of this wave. So these two waves are out of phase. These two waves were, of course, in phase. Because again, their amplitudes were in the same direction. So again, I'm going to simply break these guys up into multiple vectors. You get to pick how many you need. So if you can get away with three, use three. If you need five, use five. If you need 10, use 10. It really doesn't matter. It's just whoever works better for you. I'm going to label them A, B, C, D, E on both sides. I'm now going to add tip to tail, A to A's, B to B's, C to C's, D to E's, E's to E's. If you notice in this case, since they go in opposite directions, I'm going to actually have something that's going to go down to, Z, to this point here, then move up to the baseline and then back down. So this is my wave shape. If I was asked to draw the waves after they met, and now they've passed through each other, then I would simply have my rectangle exactly as it was, and my triangle exactly as it was, because the waves just simply passed through, and there was absolutely no change whatsoever. Likewise, if I wanted to try out the system of these guys after they've passed through, I'd have a rectangle like so, and then my triangle like so, and they would be looking exactly as they were beforehand. So it's almost like, if you will, a case of where two strangers meet each other, they say, hey, how are you doing? And then they just move on by without any changes to your lives whatsoever, because that was it. And if there was a moment, they never even noticed. Okay, so that's all there really is for finding the resultant shape of two waves that overlap. If we had three waves, we'd be doing the exact same thing, but we'd be adding three A's, three B's, three C's, three D's. But I've never really seen that type of question ever being asked. It's always been only with two. But if you notice, all it is is good old-fashioned tip-tail method of adding vectors. All right, when we meet to class, we're going to be doing some work on this stuff. So if you don't fully understand this, that's totally okay. We just want you guys to get a bit of an introduction into it before we meet.